All right. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our webinar on capstone papers and capstone courses. The purpose of our time together is to address the difference, first of all, between your final project that you complete in each class and then your final capstone requirement for the overall uh, graduate history program. They are very, very different. We're going to spend some time talking about the way in which they each should be approached while also placing a large amount of our focus on that final program requirement and centering around the idea that it's never too early to start thinking about that project because it will be here before you know it. I'd like to welcome Dr. Rob Denning, who is a uh, capstone instructor who's joining us tonight. Hello, everybody. And so as we begin, I thought it would be best to just highlight a, what I call a few key points to remember. First of all, this is graduate school. That means it's going to be intense and it's going to be a lot of work, but it's also going to be very rewarding in everything that you do. And as I referenced just a few moments ago, every class in the SNHU graduate program has a final capstone paper, which is also called your final project. That is not to be confused with the capstone that you will complete at the end of the program. Uh, some programs call it a thesis. At uh, SNHU, we call it a capstone, but it is very, very similar in the way in which it is designed. And I highlight that idea to just, again, focus on the differences that are present between your final project for each course and that final program requirement. Uh, as you begin to think about the way in which you'll approach this, is, you know, you're going to think outside the box. And anytime we approach research and the research process, we really need to be thinking outside the box anyhow. So this is just doing that on a larger scale and taking all of those skills and those ideas that you've learned and utilized throughout your program and now putting them all into action. And as you begin to do that, it's going to involve organization and planning and keeping in mind that we are talking about a final program requirement when we talk about a capstone with a capital C is the best way to identify those ideas. The other thing we want to do is kind of keep in mind and put in perspective of how quickly this final capstone requirement is going to go ahead and develop and ultimately have to start to come into focus. You know, throughout your graduate course work, you know, each class lasts 10 weeks. That 10 weeks does move by very, very quickly. And in each, throughout the program, you're also going to take 11 courses, and it's 501, 502, and then 510, and 520. And then your electives, and then you get into those capstone requirements courses, which are those 700 level courses. We highlight this because it's important to note that you should really start thinking about your capstone project at the beginning of the program. You know, if you're as early as 501 right now, and this is your very first term, it's not too early to start thinking about that. And a lot of times students will approach, you know, their graduate program with a focus on, yes, I know what I want to research, and this is the direction I'm going to go only to find out that it doesn't always work out the way you thought. And, you know, that's not a discouraging aspect. It, it should not be. It's just focused on the research process and how it is a process that ultimately develops and has to have a lot of thought work behind it. Also wanted to take a look at the course descriptions for each of the 700 courses because, as I referenced, those are your capstone courses, and those are the ones in which we are focusing on in our time together tonight. And Dr. Denning will jump in periodically with some focus on each one of these courses as well. And I thought the best way to approach them is really just to look at the course description. And when we look at 790, which is the research seminar for the historian, the capstone experience integrates knowledge and skills developed in previous coursework with a focus on developing scholarship in a student's chosen area of specialization. This course focuses on helping students propose a topic for research, conduct preliminary research on primary and secondary sources, and develop a capstone research proposal. This course prepares students for the formal capstone submission in the subsequent capstone course. Students must have completed 24 credits in their program to enroll in this course. One of the first things I wanted to highlight again was the idea that, you know, this course and by the time you get to the capstone, you are working with knowledge and skills that you've already developed and utilized in previous courses. The other key element to remember in 790 is the fact that you are working on a research proposal and making the case for why your research is needed and the direction in which you will go in that research. Dr. Denning, do you have anything to add to 790 as it relates to well, the course description? Yeah, so 790 is meant to be a 
you're revisiting the skills that you're learning in History 502. In History 502, the final project is a research proposal. So you've done this before when you get to History 790. But by the time you get to 790, you also have a good five or six or seven or more courses under your belt. So you've got a lot more content knowledge. You've got a lot more historiographical background in the topics that interest you. So the second time around with a proposal in 790 should be much more developed than the one you did in 502. 502 is a good start. 790 is building upon that, that skill. Uh, but it will incorporate a lot of information that you have hopefully accrued in the meantime. In 790, you need to deploy your historiographical skills. You need to demonstrate how your work fits with the existing literature that's out there on your particular research topic. You need to be able to explain how your work is different and how it fills a gap in the existing literature. Just like you did in 502, but now you're, you're a bit more experienced with it now. And so your proposal is going to lay out a potential argument for your project. You're going to lay out how it fits into the literature. You're going to identify topics, or you know, not topics. Um, you're going to identify sources, research, uh, uh, primary sources, secondary sources that you've accumulated along the way. And you're going to develop a research plan to identify how you'll finish this project when you get to the actual capstone of the course, which we'll, we'll talk about next year. And I'll come back and probably fill in some more details as we go. Yeah, and I'm so glad you made the connection there between 502 and 790 as it relates to the development of that research proposal. You know, a lot of times when students approach 502, they've never developed a research proposal before. And it, it is something that is new as it relates to the way in which the historian writes, because obviously you're making the case for your research rather than completing the research. And in a research proposal, if you complete the research, that is not making the case for the research. So very, very important to highlight the connections that are present between those two courses. And also keeping in mind that as you're going through 502, you know, when you, when you hear your instructor continuously reference the idea that you're making the case for the research, that is so important to keep in mind when making a research proposal because they're very, very different in the writing styles between the paper and the proposal. 791, the actual capstone where your research that you proposed in 790 now takes shape and actually occurs. The capstone experience integrates knowledge and skills developed in previous coursework with a focus on developing scholarship in a student's chosen area of specialization. This course extends students' research proposals into a formal capstone project. Students will workshop and submit their final capstone projects in this course. Again, this is where you're actually completing your research. One key element that I would note, and, and Dr. Denning uh, will expand upon this, is the fact that you don't have to wait until you begin 791 to begin the writing process. I would say that you shouldn't wait <laughs> until 791 to start the project because in History 791, it's a 10-week course, but you, the first draft of your project is due in week five for peer review with your other students. And as you will see, these are some major assignments. We're talking 75 to 100 pages of work, and that's hard to do in five weeks. So I always suggest to students, do not wait until History 791 to start actually writing the thing. You should be working on it ahead of time. You should be working on it. I mean, you can start working on it when you have your 500 level classes. You should definitely be working on this project while you're doing your 600 level classes so that, that way when you get to the 700 level classes at the end of your program, you're in a pretty good position to actually finish this thing in time because those first five weeks of History 791 and 792 was said it the same way for public historians, those first five weeks are going to fly by. And if you don't have a draft due by the end of that, then you're going to be put into a very awkward position because your other fellow students are going to be counting on you to have a draft that they can review because they're getting graded on the review in addition to you getting graded for the draft. So work on this ahead of time. Um, it's pretty much a requirement for success in 791 is that you have to have a good plan before you go in. That's why we have you do the proposal in History 790 so that you have a plan for finishing the research. But realistically, you need to get started on this before you get to the 790 sequence so that when you get to 791, 792, you have a much better chance of finishing this within that very short amount of time. One of the other capstone courses is for public historians, which is 792. 
So if you're on a public track, uh, public historian track, excuse me, you will focus on 790 and then 792. In 792, the capstone experience integrates knowledge and skills developed in previous coursework with a focus on developing the final capstone deliverable. Public historians will demonstrate the skills they have learned in conceiving of maintaining and managing content for public history organizations. Students will workshop and submit their final versions of their capstone in this course. And we're going to take a look at 792 here shortly as it relates to how this capstone project actually develops. So we're going to circle back to this idea. But what I wanted to do first is look at really the relationship between 790, 791, and 792 beyond those course descriptions and beyond that general overview that we provided for each one of those uh, courses at this point. Like we talked about with 790, what we need to remember is this is your research proposal. In the research proposal, just as you did in 502, you are focusing on proposing the thesis and the hypothesis of your work. This is where you're going to complete your literature review that's going to identify historiographical trends and gaps and making that plan for research and writing the capstone paper. 790 is the research proposal for what you'll do in 791 and 792. Additionally, with the research proposal, with revisions and working closely with your capstone instructor in 790, this will serve as the introduction to the final capstone assignment. The thesis, like I said, the literature overview, and the outline of the project. Why is your research needed? What gap is present? And ultimately, what does your research add to existing secondary scholarly material on the topic? Remember, that is a key element of the research proposal, making the case for why your research is needed and how it differs from current scholarship on the topic. When we look at the capstone requirements for the research historian, this is a 75 to 100 page formal research project. And just like any other paper that you write as it relates to completing research, you're making an argument. This is a very well developed and a very detailed research paper. And it also has to be an original contribution to literature and should incorporate as broad a range of sources as possible. And as Dr. Denning referenced a few moments ago, you don't want to wait till you get to 791 to begin this research work. That's Anything right. To add this, to that? Is a large, this is a large project, and it's intimidating, I will grant you. <laughs> it's, it's, that's kind of the nature of historical research, though. Your job as a professional historian, especially at the master's level, is to create something that is new something that is original, something that is novel, that's creating a new argument. Your job is not to reinvent what another historian has already done. Your job is to do something new. And that is intimidating. I understand that. It's, and, but every historian starts with a blank page and with the knowledge that they have to do something new. And so every master's student and PhD student, and any, any grad student in history that came before you has had to do this exact same thing. And this is it, why I always suggest students kind of, you know, work with your instructors. Your instructors have done this before, and your instructors can help you through that that obstacle or that barrier. Because we don't, we, we all have been there, we've all done it, and so we all can help. Uh, the instructors can help students to figure this stuff out. But it is, it does have to be original. It has to be new. Um, no reinventing the wheel here, and that's not as hard as it sounds, uh, because everybody looks at sources differently, everybody interprets sources differently, and so everybody do have, it, just about, everybody does have something new and original to say about a historical topic. Some topics are going to be more played out than others. Uh, the American Civil War usually is a kind of a difficult topic because there's been literally thousands of books written on it, and so it can be hard to find something new to say about the American Civil War, but you never know. Uh, but there are also a lot of other topics out there that have not had thousands of books written on them. So. Uh, this can play into your topic selection a bit, is to make sure you find a topic and a potential argument about that topic that has not been done before. And again, this is where your literature review is vitally important, especially at History 790 when you're doing that proposal. You need to be able to demonstrate that no one's actually done this before. And then you'll make that point again when you do the final project. Um, and when you do your introduction, you'll talk about how, how, what other people have said about this, and how your project is different, how your project fits with the existing literature, how it's different from the existing literature. And um, 
it's not as hard as it sounds, but it is intimidating. I understand that. But work closely with your instructors and they'll help you get through that. The capstone for 792 in the public historian track does look slightly different than the research historian. And on the screen, you can see the kind of the breakdown of the way in which this ultimately will develop. And, and these are rough estimates of page numbers. Dr. Denning, can you shed some light on the differences between the capstone for the public historians versus the research historians? It's very different. The <laughs> research historian has to write a very long essay, 75 to 100 pages. The public historian does the same type of work, but the final result, the final product is different. It can take many forms. It can take the form of a, a museum exhibit, or as we've got this list here of walking tour, of oral history projects, of some sort of archival finding aid. There's lots of potential avenues uh, for the final project in History 792. You will still write up a 40-ish you know, page summary of the project where you talk about the, res the research that you conducted. You'll do a literature review there talking about how your exhibit differs from other exhibits that have been on the same topic. So you'll still do all of the same type of work as the research historian. The written component will be a bit shorter, like I said, somewhere around 40 pages once you start doing the introduction and all of that stuff. But you'll also have this other physical or digital object that will accompany it. And the object is where you're going to spend probably a lot of your time working. And so students tend to look at the page count for the 792 capstone and think, oh, well, that seems a lot easier than the page count for the 791 topic. But the reality is that you're doing the same amount of work and you're doing the same type of work. It's just the final ultimate product looks different. Um, and the 791 research project is a bit more straightforward. It's a bit more what historians are used to seeing, uh, a very long essay with multiple chapters and proper formatting and all of that. The public history capstone is a little bit different from what we're used to seeing, but it does incorporate some sort of, of project that is intended to help the public to understand history in a certain way. History 791, you're writing a, re a research essay basically for other academics and other research historians. Public historians, you're creating a capstone that is going to be interactive among the public, and it's meant to inform the public on some historical event. The research historian isn't necessarily worried about the general public, but the public historian is. And so you'll work closely with your instructor in History 792 to figure out what is the final form of this project going to be, what's the best way to create it, what are the kind of best practices for presenting this information to the public. You'll work closely with your instructor to kind of narrow down what that final project is going to look like. But in general, you'll end up at the end of the term with a 40-ish page paper plus some sort of digital or possibly even physical object that you're actually going to be able to show to the public. So when we focus on whether it's the research historian or the public historian in terms of 791, 792 that you're working on, the preparation for both is very, very similar. And it's because, as Dr. Denny said, we're focusing on the research process. You know, and when we talk about how to prepare, you know, they're all very similar in terms of how you want to approach it. First of all, you want to have a good understanding and focus on terrain. Uh, you know, throughout your academic program, your instructors are going to constantly tell you about Turabian format. And there's a reason for that. It's very important. We do place a high importance on Turabian because it's what is used within history when we complete our writing. And, you know, we have to have that working knowledge of it because when you work, move out into the field and into the discipline even further, you're going to need to have that working knowledge of Turabian. You also want to begin to think about your capstone now. Um, as I referenced earlier, it doesn't matter if you're just in 501 or you're in 502 or you're even further along. You know, your capstone needs to be front and center in your mind in terms of potential topics. And you also have a potential to utilize, um, you know, different takes on topics. You know, like Dr. Denning said, the Civil War might not be the most, the best way to go. You know, the Battle of Gettysburg, for example. But there's other ways in which you can approach the topic, you know, and, and 
sometimes it's best to look local and, and that's what I would really encourage you to do. And I know Dr. Denny would do the same because you have the ability to access the resources, access the material. And when we talk about that original contribution to scholarly research, looking local is a great way to do it. And it's going to give you access to primary sources that you would not have as it relates to some other potential national topics or the, just the ability to access them as it relates to completing your research. You can also continue to develop topics as you move through your overall uh, academic program. You know, you could continue to refine and take differing approaches to topics. Dr. Denning, can you expand upon that idea in terms of how you could use a topic and continue to build it while also keeping in mind that concept of uh, self-plagiarism? Yeah, this is uh, a fairly common issue in history programs and in other kind of academic research programs. We tend to build on our previous work. Uh, historians will work on, will kind of build on the work of previous historians, but they will also tend to build on the work of, on their own work that they have done before. And that's fine. Uh, some historians stick with the same historical topic for their entire careers. Some jump from topic to topic, but some stick with it the entire time. And that's fine. Um, the longer that you study a topic, of course, the better informed you're going to be about it, and the more of an authority you will be on that particular topic. And so we welcome students to pursue their topics of interest, and they can continue to use this, keep studying the same topic in multiple courses throughout the MA program. You still have to submit original work to every course, though. You cannot reuse papers. You cannot, uh, you know, Self-plagiarism is just the same thing as plagiarism, where you're copying something that has already been submitted for credit somewhere else. Whether you were the writer or where somebody else was the writer, plagiarism is plagiarism. So, but you can continue to work on the same topic. You just have to contribute or submit new papers each time. And that shouldn't be difficult. As you progress, you're going to read new books about your topic. You're going to find new primary sources about your topic. So you're going to find new things to say about your topic all the time. So it should not be difficult to come up with something new to say in every term, in every paper that you're submitting in every term. You just have to be careful not to reuse stuff that you've already submitted for credit somewhere else. Um, and so that could be a sentence, it could be a paragraph, it could be a page, it could be the entire thing. That's all bad. Uh, all of our papers are run through Turnitin.com, and so it will pick up plagiarism. Just even if it's self-plagiarism, it'll still get picked up in Turnitin.com. So. Uh, professional standards are you can reuse topics, uh, you can even sometimes reuse arguments that you're making about topics, you can obviously reuse sources from paper to paper, but you do have to contribute something new each time. You have to be saying new things, going in new directions. Most of the courses that you go to, the final projects, are going to be slightly different in expectations anyway. And so it really wouldn't be possible to submit the same paper over and over again and still meet the requirements of each course's final projects. But it's still something that you should be wary of, aware of. You should not be re reusing your own work in subsequent classes. But again, it is fine to reuse topics, sources, general arguments, and all of that. Because we, I think it's great when students come in uh, knowing what their final project is going to be on and every course to further develop that project, approach it from new perspectives, take it in new directions, experiment with writing styles and all that. That stuff is great. You just have to be careful not to cross that line into self-plagiarism. And could you also touch on the importance of Turabian format as it relates to the what we do now with the graduate work is the submission to ProQuest? Yes. We, at the end of your program, you will have the ability to preserve your capstone project in the ProQuest electronic theses and, and dissertation database, which is a national database where lots of universities preserve their um, their capstone projects. They call it, whether they call it a dissertation or a thesis or a capstone, whatever, they preserve it there so that other scholars can go and read those. So even though you'll graduate from SNHU, somebody from UC Davis could do a search on ProQuest to find your work. And so we want your work to make a difference. So we want people to be able to find your work. We don't want your work to just, you know, die on a hard drive somewhere. We 
wanted to be shared with the public and with other scholars. What's the point of doing this if you're not going to share your work with people? So we upload your project to ProQuest, but you have to meet kind of the basic professional standards of formatting, and that's where Turabian comes in. Turabian's guidelines for citing sources, formatting papers, that is the history field standard for doing that. And if you want your work to get taken seriously by other scholars, you need to have the proper formatting at the very least. And Turabian is the guide to help you do that. So we assign Turabian as a reading in almost all of our graduate courses. Um, maybe you won't be talking about it specifically in a particular course, but you should have that thing handy at all times. I've got mine on my bookshelf right, right next to me. And you, you'll use that every time you write a paper to make sure you've got the proper formatting, the proper citations. You get the practice while you're doing all of your coursework, and then when you get to the capstone, hopefully it won't be too difficult for you because you have lots of practice by that time. I know at first, when you first come into a history program and you're expected to, to abide by these very strange and seemingly arbitrary rules of Turabian, I know that seems weird, but as you get used to it, it's, you kind of come to understand what its usefulness is because it does create kind of a standard format for citations that makes it easier to understand sources and all that once you, once you get used to it. And it's just one of the one of those things of working in a profession that you have to abide by the profession's standards. Turabian is one of the history profession standards. Very good. The other important aspect to focus on is we, when we talk about preparation is to really start to identify sources. You know, as you're working on a topic and kind of thinking about a topic and the direction you may go, build a source file. And that's going to include primary and secondary sources that are both online, offline. You know, uh, I will tell you, and this is something I'm sure your instructors have all shared with you, you cannot only rely on online research for uh, research purposes. You are going to have to visit libraries. And when it comes to secondary, or excuse me, primary sources, you're going to actually have to step into physical archives. And that is for the benefit of your research and it's to complete your research. So definitely kind of keep that idea in mind as you begin to focus on the idea of a topic. Develop that file, focus on where potential sources may exist and how you could identify those sources. You also want to build relationships. And, and there's several ways to do this as it relates to, you know, research librarians and, you know, with course instructors that might be able to help you, but there's many ways to build relationships to focus on and really enhance your future research uh, skills and ability to ultimately complete research. So kind of place your focus on that as well, and also plan research trips. You know, for example, if you're going on vacation and you have an idea of a topic, you know, say you're going to be in Washington, D.C., for example, stop by the National Archives. You know, make an appointment and see what you can find and what you can dig into. There's multiple ways in which to do it, especially if you're looking, as we referenced before, that local topic. Uh, great way to build relationships being at the local level. Great way to plan research trips. And you are going to find it much, much easier as you work through the research process to access the source material, especially those primary sources that you need by looking local. You will also want to experiment with writing styles and methodologies in your 500 and 600 level courses. You know, like Dr. Dang said, you can continue to build on topics, you can continue to go different directions with each topic, and that's also going to help you figure out what works and what doesn't work. You know, I think when we approach research, it's very, very important to remember that we all have wonderful research ideas. And there's nothing wrong with the ideas that we have, but then we sit down to start the research process and we quickly find out why uh, they've never been researched before. You know, you're going to have issues with topics or source materials and things like that. So the more that you play with the topic and try to figure out directions to topics early in your program, the better you're going to be prepared for uh, the writing of the capstone as you approach those 700 courses. Anything to add to that, Dr. Dang? Yeah, I just want to second your idea about local sources or local topics and local sources. Because as, 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 as Professor Klein mentioned, we do expect you to access offline sources. This is an online program, and I know that we get kind of used to using online sources when a lot of our courses, the assigned readings are oftentimes available online through JSTOR or through other websites. 
And so we get kind of used to the idea that, oh, we can do all of our research online. The problem, the obvious problem, though, is that not all primary sources around the world have been digitized. So they're not, the vast majority of primary sources around the world are not available online. And if you want to be taken seriously as a scholar, if you want to claim to be an authority on a particular historical topic, you need to be familiar with all of the existing primary sources, whether they're available online or offline. And so being offline, that is going to require you to visit them offline, because not all of them are available online. And so you can do this a variety of ways. You can, um, like, like you've got here, you can you know, plan research trips. That can be expensive. It can be difficult to do if you're working full time. Uh, so one way to kind of balance that is to work on a topic that is local. If you only have to go down to the County Historical Society, if that's the farthest you have to go to find primary sources, then that's that's a pretty good way to, to work and learn skills and to work the and to take advantage of all of those opportunities. If you're gonna have to go to the National Archives in Maryland, that can be difficult if you're based in Washington. But if you just have to go, you know, maybe one town over to access the local historical society, that might be a lot more realistic. Uh, the second advantage to focusing on a local topic is that the odds are greater that nobody has ever touched it before. You might be a true trailblazer if you're focusing on a local topic because you know, you're the first person to actually take an interest in that local topic. You're the first person to do major research on that topic. And so you don't really have to worry about the existing secondary sources and finding a gap in the, in the existing sources and all of that stuff that you've been worrying about throughout the rest of the program. If you've got something no one has ever written anything on, then you're you're pretty well set. You don't have to worry about reinventing the wheel or copying someone else's process or anything like that. You've got a kind of a built-in hedge against that type of an issue. So it's a good idea to fo focus, to go local as often as you can. And there are ways to do it where if your interest is in something national, you can still make connections between something that happened locally and something that happened nationally. If your interest is the American Civil War, like we said, it's difficult to find something new to say about the American Civil War. But if you live in I don't know, Lancaster, Ohio, maybe you can write your paper on, you know, what was Lancaster, Ohio like during the Civil War? Uh, you're still talking about the topic that you like, but you've found a new direction to take where you're finding local sources. You don't have to make big research trips. You're also finding something that probably no one else has ever written on. So. That's, I, I, I would just like to emphasize and kind of support uh, Professor Klein's uh, statement about trying to go local, because I think that's always a good idea for a capstone project, especially. And I would also add, it can just be really fun to, to dig into that local topic and, and make those, true, like you yeah. mentioned, those uh, connections between the local and the national are sometimes very, very intriguing, and uh, you never know where you'll go with that. So keep that in mind as well, because you could open some doors for future work. And it's also it sometimes to... cool to, when you're doing research, to say, hey, you know, this, the corner of Main Street and Fifth Avenue, I know where that is. That's just kind of, it's just kind of a cool thing to do while you're researching, too, is just kind of reimagine your current environment as it existed in the past. It just kind of gives it a little bit more of a connection to your own life and to the life of people. So what's the common thread between all of these ideas? Organization. Uh, you're going to have to be organized. You're going to have to start early and start early with that organizational aspect as well. You know, when you find sources like we talked about, build that file, build those connections, uh, develop those working lists, whatever that looks like for you. You know your style and you know how you are best organized. It, it could be, you know, something as, as simple as Google Drive, for example in terms of just putting everything in one place and making sure you have access to it, it could be something more um, intricately designed. That That is your style that needs to work for you, but the key element is to remain organized and stay organized early. You'll want to develop, like I said, that system that works for you, which is directly related to time management. You know, um, as we talked about, you cannot wait till you get to 791, 792 to start the writing process. You know, um, it, it, it will not go well um, at all. And, you know, it's not a discouraging statement I make. That's just reality, you know. So when you're setting yourself up for success, start early. Be focused on that time management. Build those relationships. And ultimately keep in mind that you can accomplish this. When you have completed the program, 
and completed the capstone and get it back, you will feel an immense se uh, sense of pride. And that is definitely something that um, you deserve to feel at the end of the program. Yes, and that's, and that's one of the reasons that we do that ProQuest uh, submission process is that we want you to, you know, you did accomplish something. You did something really cool, something that nobody has ever done before. Well, I mean, the pro people have done research projects before, but your particular project is unique. No one has ever made that same project that you've done before. You're con you are contributing something new to the conversation about a historical topic. And that is an amazing feeling. It's something that very few people ever do. And it's something to be proud of. And, and it seems difficult. It seems, you know, maybe even unlikely <laughs> as you're going through the process. But uh, again, work with your instructors. We've all, we've all been through that. Um, and be patient, be, employ good time management skills, develop relationships, be organized, all these common threads that we're talking about here, but also work with your fellow students and your instructors. Uh, they will help you get through this, and that's, that's what we're here for. That's our job. So take advantage of all the resources that you, that you can. Uh, and then you'll also probably have to rely on family to you know, walk the dog and all that while you're too working late into the night, but that's important too. You can have your social relationships will help you get through this also. It's not, you're not alone in this. And you've got lots of people around you at school and in your work life, in your home life. You've got lots of people that would help you get through it. And they will all be proud of it at the end also. You're not doing this just for you. You're also doing it for the people around you. They will feel a sense of accomplishment also when you make this accomplishment. So keep at it. You, you'll be fine. You'll get through it. <laughs> we will get you through it. And it's also really, really cool when you can like go to ProQuest and search your name, you know, and you can yes, show your family yes. members that too. So, you know, hey, I mean, I'll admit it. It's fun. It's cool to see that happen, you know. But, uh, you know, you just all those little things. You think about, I say that because there's the reward at the end. And, you know, yes, we can laugh about that. Yes, we can talk about that. But that is the reward that comes. You have finished this and you've accomplished a great task. And it's something to be very, very proud of. So, uh, Think about that as the light at the end of the tunnel as you're starting to go through it. You know, search your name in ProQuest. So I'd like to thank you for attending. If you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to contact your instructor or post in the learning community. We are all more than happy to assist. And if you are beginning the capstone process, remember the, ins the capstone instructor is there to help you just as every other instructor that you've had throughout your courses at SNHU. So develop relationships and uh, we're all in this together. Thank you very much and have a great day.